Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Brahim Aude. From Palestine to Hawaii, our topic uh, for this program. And to discuss this uh, topic, we have Cindy Franklin, professor of English uh, at UH uh, Manoa. We have also Sarah Hamid. Uh, she's Women's Studies and Sustainability Studies major at UHM. And also we have Ali Muslih, who is a PhD candidate in political science at UHM as well. So welcome all, and thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, this is like at the end of the semester, so everybody is busy. So <laughs> that's good that uh, we are here. And then, um, um, well, when we say from Palestine to Hawaii, Cindy, we'll, we start with you. What uh, comes to mind, given that you have been active in uh, the indigenous struggles and for peace and justice? Um, well, as a faculty member who has um, been involved with the co-founding of UH Students and Faculty for Justice in Palestine, mm -hmm. one of the things that you know um, I felt that we were positioned to do that that those of us involved have been working to do is to think about the situatedness of a UH SFJP chapter um, from this particular location mm -hmm. and to think about the connections between Hawaii and Palestine as two sites of settler colonialism, as two sites that are under occupation. And to also think about the U.S.'s role, um, not only as you know the occupier of Hawaii, but as the primary sponsor for the occupation of Palestine, since we, since the U.S. pays four billion dollars a year to support that occupation and the ongoing practices of settler colonialism. So one of the things that we have been working to do is to get a conversation going so that um, we bring in Palestinian scholars mm -hmm. who can meet with Palestinians here, such as Ali, as well as um, people who are active in the Hawaiian struggle as well as interested in mm. forging connections to Palestine. So we've been doing that pretty consistently for the last six years mm -hmm. now by um, largely bringing in a guest each year under the heading of Decolonial November, mm -hmm. starting with Noura Arakat in 2014. Mm -hmm. And so we can talk more about the people we've brought sure. in, but some of the things that we've been doing have been to hold a panel at the Kamakakuakalani Center for mm -hmm. Hawaiian Studies that thematizes the connections and mm. allows people to discuss those. Mm -hmm. So um, just yeah. for starters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good, yeah. good. And Sarah, um, your connection with all of this and uh, also with the, uh, especially with the student and faculty for justice mm -hmm. in Palestine. So how did you get into all of that um, and justice in general? So it's um, a fun story. My very first class at the University of Hawaii Amano was instructed by Ili Malong, who is um, a longtime friend and colleague of most of the people here. And I, we were discussing topics for one of my final research papers in her course. And I mentioned that um, I had a great interest in solidarity, particularly with Palestine and um, with other occupied places in the world and Ilima directed me to the wonderful Cindy Franklin <laughs> and um, she introduced me to some of the visiting speakers that were here for Decolonial November. Uh, that was my first introduction right off the bat and it, we hit the ground running and um, just got to talk about our engagement with the cross global issues I guess between Hawaii and Palestine and helping slightly to kind of coordinate some of the events on the student organizing end mm -hmm. uh, with various events that go on during Decolonial November. So kind of working and meeting with some of the visiting um, scholars as well as taking them to various events on campus that we have here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Later on, we'll uh, talk more about that. I'll ask you mm -hmm. about uh, yeah. those kinds of activities. And Ali, um, you've been a long time um, you know, worker for justice uh, in Palestine and in Hawaii. So how did that um, work for you over the years? Um, it started in 2013, actually, mm -hmm. after I met Cindy. Mm -hmm. uh, she uh, came to the political science department shortly after her arrival from Palestine. Um, and she, uh, um, 
did a talk mm -hmm. on, on a situation there. Uh, uh, I remember particularly about Hebron, and uh, she showed us uh, pictures uh, she took from there and told us about her experience. And um, uh, we connected afterwards, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we became excellent friends, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and uh, ever since then, we've been trying to get Palestinians to yeah. come here and build relationships oh. with, with them and helping them build relationships with, with this place and, and its people. Uh -huh. um, uh, so it, it's been great. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, the question of Palestine, so to speak, uh, is uh, not uh, strange to you, right? <laughs> no. So I, could you say something about it? Um, I uh, I was born in Amman, Jordan, to mm -hmm. two Palestinian refugees. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, uh, my my parents uh, were a little bit hesitant to uh, kind of teach us about Palestine and particularly tell us about their own experiences, mm -hmm. which were <laughs> which were difficult, of course, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not so different from other Palestinian mm -hmm. stories, mm -hmm. but. Um, uh, they never shared that personal mm -hmm. dimension. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, uh, and, and their point was basically to make us feel like uh, we have a home and not mm -hmm. feel kind of uh, just a continuation of this story of statelessness, yeah, statelessness right, right. and trauma. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, my story with Palestine actually began in, in, in school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, the school I went to uh, was uh, uh, built by uh, the Arab Cultural Foundation, uh, which uh, uh, basically emerged after the 1967 war. And it was a response to uh, the sense of defeat and uh, a question of how to rebuild a nation mm -hmm. uh, that can decolonize and free itself mm -hmm. and really build something new. Uh, so uh, I think, yeah, my story with Palestine, though it began at home, mm -hmm. uh, it really flourished uh, mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Um, and ever since then, it's been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm Palestinian too. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> I have like those memories and all of this. And you know, we, the family went to Lebanon mm. um, from there, uh, from Palestine, because Lebanon was closer to the Galilee where we come from. And um, yeah, it was uh, like a journey um, of uh, uh, creating uh, like some kind of identity, you know, in the midst of all this uh, tumult, you know, in the Arab world as a whole. Sure. So uh, it was uh, an interesting, uh, now looking back at it, it was an interesting thing. And I wouldn't do anything else uh, except that if I could repeat it, because it really builds uh, identity, confidence, and also justice, you know, a sense of justice that you uh, remains with you all the time, and then you go forward from that fighting for justice and peace as well. Yeah. To be honest, it's hard to escape it. Yeah, uh, right. You're, uh, uh, you're always a, a political entity wherever you go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so you always try hard to really build your identity, manage it. Uh, yeah shape it, yeah. uh, especially when there are other forces that are trying to shape it for you. Yeah, of course. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, as Edward Said says, uh, like, you are always on the other side of power. You do not, like, uh, <clears throat> go with the flow because the flow is not justice and peace, you know. It's warmongering and, uh, you know, um, injustice, shall we say, Absolutely. be it in Hawaii and Palestine and uh, anywhere else in Tombaktu, Mali, for instance, wherever. Yeah. So, um, OK, Cindy, um, could you tell us uh, more about uh, maybe we can uh, begin with the activities that happened this past November mm -hmm. and then uh, move forward, but going backward. Okay. <laughs> so this was a really excellent yeah. November mm -hmm. um, for in terms of building these connections in part because um, 
the American Studies Association mm -hmm. convention was held in November in Honolulu. And the uh, American Studies Association is known, whether famously or infamously, <laughs> depending on who you ask, for passing a boycott resolution um, to um, support the U.S. Uh, campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. They supported academic boycott in 2013. This made headlines. It was on the front page of the New York Times. Um, Israel it was on the front page of Israeli papers. Um, it's been, it's resulted in lawsuits from, uh, spearheaded by Kenneth Marcus, who is uh, a Trump appointee for civil rights <laughs> in the spirit of <laughs> pick the opposite. <laughs> um, and so the ASA has been a staunch supporter of Palestine. And so it was kind of great to have that conference coincide. And so what we did was we had Noura Erekat was coming for that mm. conference and mm. she was our first visitor for this kind of series in 2014. Mm. And her book, Justice for Some, Ha, um, has just come out uh, through Stanford University Press mm -hmm. and actually just won a Palestine Book Award. And so she was interested in giving a talk in addition to an ASA panel, which was actually on solidarity. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was here, and we also have Man Auda, who is um, a Palestinian who's been in Hawaii for a few years and has an embroidery project called Refugee Stitches. Mm -hmm. And so he actually gave a um, presentation on his embroidery at the start of the month. We also had Kehalani Kawanui coming in for the ASA. Mm -hmm. She's one of the named defendants in the ASA lawsuit. So she was able to give a talk um, about that lawsuit, but also Kehalani is, of course, um, as a Kanaka Maoli scholar, and as someone who's been kind of really interested in thinking about connections between Hawaii and Palestine was a good person to bring into this. And then we also had an um, um, invitation out to Yusuf Al-Jamal, who is from Gaza. Mm -hmm. And the plan was for him to come for a few weeks and give some talks and participate in the solidarity panel on ASA. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened with Yusuf was his visa was denied. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, in the meantime, we invited someone else who was having um, some difficulties entering into Palestine. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it turned out, Yusuf, with congressional support, was able to come. So mm -hmm. we had two visitors, which was really exciting. Mm -hmm. And Noura and Yusuf. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, Ma'an? Um, uh, and, okay, and, and, and <laughs> <laughs> so we had four. Right? We had five, actually. Five, okay. And then, you know, um, uh, Rana. Oh, um, Rana, yeah. So, uh, and one of the things that we did was we went to Mauna Kea, mm -hmm. um, uh, Rana and Yusuf and Kehalani and I, and we taught classes at Pu'uhulu Hulu mm -hmm. University. Mm -hmm. And then um, each of them gave talks at the university, at ASA, and then at... Um, um, Noura gave a talk at the Kamaka Kualani Center for mm -hmm. Hawaiian Studies. So we had a, a really rich set of offerings mm -hmm. this um, this past November. Yeah, because uh, Yusuf was talking to me about like you know going there and having gone to Mauna Kea and all of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yusuf mm -hmm. was someone that um, I've been wanting to bring out ever since he participated mm -hmm. in a in our special journal mm -hmm. and um, issue Life mm -hmm. in Occupied Palestine, yeah, where as uh, you'll remember, the subject of his essay was traveling while Pal Palestinian mm -hmm. and talking about his connections with um, a, um, between Palestine and Aotearoa mm -hmm. and his interest in the Pacific. So mm -hmm. he's had a, a kind of long-standing interest in Palestinian Pacific connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's uh, true. And um, you also, um, Sarah, participated um, in, in those kinds of uh, uh, activities, right? Mm -hmm. So could you say something from your perspective and maybe perspective of uh, some of your colleagues, uh, um, you know, who uh, also participated in that? How did they look at those kinds of activities? Mm -hmm. So I think especially now with everything all the energy and organizing that's happening on the UH campus in relation to Mauna Kea, it actually 
was the perfect time for uh, some wonderful Palestinian scholars and comrades to come visit us because we're ready. <laughs> so it meant that they kind of came in at a time in which the university and, its, and the organizations in opposition to the TMT and in protection of Mauna Kea are really organized and ready for people to come learn mm -hmm. and to come share. And that's exactly what happened with uh, most of the Palestinian scholars. I only got to meet two of them, unfortunately, um, but I did get to spend some time with Youssef and mm -hmm. we got to go to our noon AHA, our protocol, which is put on by Kia'ike Kahokani, a student-led uh, organization in the protection, in support of the Kia'ia Mauna Kea, and Yusuf got to participate, and we kind of talked about the various elements of the organizing that's going on on campus and how they connect to Palestine. We got to talk extensively, actually, about Yusuf's engagement uh, with Aotearoa and his interest in pursuing a degree in indigenous studies, and that was really refreshing to see just because I feel like sometimes we here with um, the UH students and faculty for justice in Palestine almost feel like we're just talking to each other. That's how I feel sometimes. We're just talking to each other because people are so often not willing to listen, you know, mm. and they don't come in with open minds and a willingness to really find justice. And so to have Yusuf and Rana come in and give these presentations and then getting to talk with Yusuf about how Palestinians are indigenous people and talking about the plethora of connections that Palestinians have made across the globe in the Pacific and Hawaii was a really refreshing and rewarding experience. And it made me feel like what we were doing, the connections we were building were empowering each other to continue this journey and this you know, quest for justice, not just in Hawaii, not just in the Pacific, but in Palestine and everywhere. Yeah, well, uh, just like uh, on that, uh, when you said like uh, people were not um, interested, mm -hmm. um, meaning like the general public or uh, the people you're talking with like on campus or the people you, <coughs> uh, you know, like uh, who are uh, in the indigenous struggle, uh, mm -hmm. what do you mean? So UH right now, I can say, just speaking on my personal experience, I feel that it's a very tense place to be. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of us who have been engaged in the fight against the TMT, mm -hmm. we can see that through the very strategic moves that the administration has made. There's been a series of emails that have been sent out that essentially send the message, we don't support you and we don't mm -hmm. support um, your protection mm -hmm. on campus. Mm -hmm. And those people that are organizing for Mauna Kea against the TMT are not the people that aren't in support of Palestine. In fact, they're the same people that are organizing with us to put on Decolonial November and to keep the organization viable and putting all the paperwork through and really working uh, together for both issues. So the people I would say that don't necessarily or aren't willing to attend these events are the rest of the campus population who because we're in Hawaii, don't really seem to engage much or really respect indigenous people, indigenous rights and indigenous struggles. And I think that's evident through the TMT is that there's been so many faculty members and so many students and people involved with the university that are completely okay with saying blatantly racist statements about Kia'i and about Kanaka Maoli and their opposition to the TMT. And those are the same people that are going to say the same things about our support for people in Palestine. They're going to say the same anti-indigenous racist comments. And so while I don't think we I personally don't think we need to engage with them, there are a lot of students that don't necessarily know how to engage with polarized issues. And I think that's why the UH organization, UH Students and Faculty for Justice in Palestine is so important is because it creates a space for students and faculty to come together and kind of share the questions that they have, you know, the, the news articles that they've seen and, and talk and attend panels and discussions where we're actually working through these issues rather than just step, taking a step back and saying, you know what, this is too polarizing, this is a little bit too much for me, I'm not going to engage. You know, it's actually encouraging engagement, encouraging critical thinking, and encouraging these transnational connections, not just to be made, but fostered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, uh, I'd like to follow up uh, on, on these matters with Ali. 
Um, in terms of, um, yeah, this is wonderful. You know. <laughs> uh, in terms of like uh, uh, students and uh, faculty for justice in Palestine, and you have like um, uh, a lot of people, especially um, you know uh, indigenous Hawaiians and also others, who um, are supportive of uh, you know um, uh, uh, of what's happening in Mauna Kea right now against the TMT, etc. So those, um, um, w do you think like if we have more activities uh, through SFJP uh, and um, you know other kinds of uh, issues like and connect those kinds of students uh, together with this uh, kind of issue, Palestine, and relate the Palestinian matter to the Hawaii matter, uh, that might um, um, create um, not necessarily a groundswell of activity uh, uh, initially, but uh, at least um, some kind of motion forward, uh, so that uh, you have like more people doing those kinds of activities, like you know what um, SFJP is doing uh, on campus, so that more uh, that uh, voice can um, reach other people who might be sitting on the fence, for mm -hmm. instance, or even like, you know, don't care because nobody, they never heard of this thing before. They only know about Mauna Kea, but not Palestine, you know. And so you can like have <coughs> some kind of uh, those activities to create uh, new consciousness and more people in support of S uh, uh, FJP and um, the indigenous issue, not necessarily only Mauna Kea. Um, let me just start with, uh, you know, our guests who came to visit uh, yeah. this year yeah. uh, went to Mauna Kea, mm -hmm. uh, engaged with uh, the scholars, the activists, all the people, mm -hmm. you know, who are there. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the most beautiful things about this relationship is that as you go in as a Palestinian, you don't have to explain yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't have to explain your existence. Mm -hmm. You don't have to explain that you are in a struggle against uh, settler colonialism, occupation, mm -hmm. uh, land seizure, and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, and the same thing goes with, uh, with us. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, how you receive indigenous struggle, how you see it, how you experience it, uh, is uh, is nothing strange to us. Mm -hmm. You know, when. Uh, uh, when an indigenous person here, uh, activists of Kiai, come in and say, we're protecting this land, mm -hmm. that sounds right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right yeah. sounds just, yeah. you know? Yeah, uh, um, yeah just like, uh, sorry, uh, I want to uh, inject something here. Because I know like from uh, <clears throat> Aboriginal struggles uh, in uh, Australia, mm. uh, it's interesting um, that Zionists are in uh, in on it, you know, and they are influencing that uh, Aboriginal struggle. So, you, you know, I'm talking about that is uh, this shouldn't be happening here. Uh, it's not happening, but uh, we have to like understand that if we don't do the, the, those kinds of things, others might say, well, you know, like Zionists might come in to the struggle and start influencing people because, in fact, um, a friend of mine, a uh, Jewish friend of mine, who works for justice uh, in Palestine, told me like uh, once this um, Hawaiian lady um, whom he met somewhere on the continent, uh, she went from here, from Hawaii to the continent for some kind of, uh, I think, churches in the Middle East kind of thing. And uh, she was, she had completely bought the Israeli, uh, uh, you know, narrative in Palestine. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm just saying, like, you know, those activities are important so that we can give the narrative that really is indigenous narrative and no one else is speaking for you or filling your mind with all kinds of colonial baloney, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, there are, uh, of course, the Israelis have been trying to infiltrate uh, the uh, indigenous struggles, mm -hmm. you know, all over mm -hmm. the world, uh, especially as they try to sell themselves as indigenous themselves mm -hmm. to the land. And, you know, here you have like a, a Polish 
<laughs> prime minister, you know, like yeah. a, a, the prime minister who is from uh, Poland or from somewhere in Eastern yeah. uh, Europe who comes in and says, I am indigenous. <laughs> I'm indigenous, and you're kind of, it's very confusing. <laughs> um, and, uh, but the thing is, you know, the history of Israel, of course, when it comes to uh, mm. its relationship to other settler colonial states, is it's always been in those repressive international uh, movements and orders uh, that uh, have always kind of brought together the basically this club of settler colonial states mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to war and terror, issues of security, um, injustice, uh, apartheid. So it's, it's always been present mm -hmm. in, in those uh, projects, mm -hmm. uh, global projects. Uh, so it's always been there, this, uh, there's always been this contradiction. Mm -hmm. You know, it tries to infiltrate lines, mm -hmm. especially uh, indigenous peoples, and try to kind of show uh, its recognition of their struggles. But at the end of the day, it's always siding with the people who have, you know, the tanks, the F-16s, mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, the weapons that are targeted uh, towards uh, those indigenous yeah, peoples. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a self-defeating mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever, at least in my experience, mm -hmm. it's been um, kind of uh, the opposite. There's always some kind of event that this indigenous person I'm interacting with would refer to and say, "Well, here's the injustice we felt mm -hmm. uh, in our experience with mm -hmm. uh, so and so, and Israel had a role." Mm -hmm. um, uh, these settler states are, are connected, they work together, they exchange uh, tactics, uh, technologies, they reference each other to legitimize their violence. It's very hard to, to escape that and, mm -hmm. and not take notice mm -hmm. of, of, uh, uh, of this transnational settler colonial project. Look at the question of U.S. and Israel, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any comments on that from your perspective? Well, I think that um, just to agree with everything <laughs> that Ali has said, but also to say that, you know, I think he's pointing to the fact that just as there is uh, these kind of transnational connections among settler colonial states, so too among people that are impacted by those. There are what Stephen Salida, when he mm -hmm. was out here, calls, in, you know, forms of intern slash nationalism, mm -hmm. um, where people who are experiencing those are connecting those dots, are working together in ways that are not just about saying our situations are analogous, but mm -hmm. our situations are interconnected. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very powerful. Um, and just to kind of go back to what you were saying about the Mauna, um, it was really powerful to be up there with um, Rana and Yusuf and just see people embrace them mm -hmm. and you know come up to them and they're just like, you're the Palestinians, mm -hmm. and, and talk to them about the kinds of mm -hmm. connections that they felt. Mm -hmm. And there was a Palestinian flag mm. that is, you flying know, high. flying high up there that they were really excited to mm. see. Um, there is a young hip hop artist, mm. Punahele, mm. who was up there and greeted them and had just been on a trip with yeah, yeah, um, right. uh, the Palestinian Youth Project, um, is it PYM, um, where he had toured the West Bank. And so, you know, and in a way that he said was a life-changing experience for him. And so they converged up there and were able to share experiences. So I think that kind of sense of not only, you know, just um, I see these connections, but as in terms of, of analogy, but I see these connections in terms of we are fighting for the same things is, is quite inspiring and powerful. Yeah, I, I remember the hip hop, uh, you know, artist. Yeah. Um, uh, he, he, he performed, really yeah, he performed yeah. <laughs> um, at Hawaiian Studies, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. I, uh, I was, And he uh, actually gave a, an event for UHS FJP to discuss mm -hmm. his um, his trip yeah. uh, at the Kamaka Kuahuani mm -hmm. Center for Hawaiian Studies. Yeah. And uh, performed. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, you know, I know like uh, Kehaulani and her activism uh, in terms of uh, against occupation mm -hmm. and all of that from the early 90s, actually, when she was a grad student mm -hmm. uh, and so mm -hmm. on. And then um, 
she went to Palestine, right? Uh, could you say something about that and how she made the connections? Uh, or did she make the connection before she went? or uh, And that's why she did go, or uh, what? Uh, um, Kay Halani, as a member of the U.S. Organizing Collective mm. for, actually, the advisory board for mm. the U.S. campaign for the academic and cultural mm. boycott of Israel, participated in a U.S. ACB delegation mm to the West Bank, which I believe was in 2013. Mm. And when she came back, and she's, she was a long time kind of organizer for the ASA boycott, mm. academic boycott resolution, which though it passed in 2013 was in the works for several years before that. There was a lot of groundwork laid for that. Mm -hmm. So she went on that trip, she came back and was, you know, as a scholar of Hawaiian history and politics, kind of interested in thinking about those connections, mm. which she's been doing quite methodically for the last several years. She mm. has, she's also working on a book right now on BDS, on mm. the Boycott, Divestment mm. and Sanctions Movement, that looks at just the kinds of lawfare that have been directed against that mm. movement. And so that work has taken place parallel with the work that, that Kay Helene has done that relate to Kanaka Maoli's mm -hmm. struggles. And so I think that she's always interested in those intersections without, but they've been kind of emerging organically, mm -hmm. I think, for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, Sarah, I was gonna say, like in terms of the BDS, have you been like kind of active with that? Or uh, if, uh, if you were, or uh, if you are, or are not yet, uh, I mean, <clears throat> to to um, the importance of having like um, activities around BDS mm -hmm. through um, not only through the um, uh, uh, SJFP mm -hmm. but um, uh, I mean SFJP uh, but also like uh, just by talking to people about this mm -hmm. as you having lunch or whatever it is yeah. you know or even some kind of uh, like. Uh, group meetings, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, because I think uh, that would be important to create more uh, more people coming to, mm -hmm. uh, to seeing really what it means to be for BDS and right. where BDS came about and all of that. So any other comments on those matters? Yeah, so I am not an active organizer within the BDS yeah, movement. Yeah. Um, just because there's only so much people yeah. can do in their life. <laughs> um, I would love to be, though, yeah. because I kind of came to this issue and come to this issue with a very unique perspective, one that most people don't really understand initially because I'm often racialized or read as Arab. Um, my name's Sarah Hamid. I mean, you know, a lot of people think I'm Arab, but I'm not. Um, but I am Jewish and I am Muslim mm. and I have spent extensive time in Palestine with my Zionist family members yeah. uh, when I was younger. So it's it's a very interesting dynamic because I, I uh, grew up, as you know, Ali mentioned, with that kind of Zionist propaganda being fed to me. Um, a lot of the modern American Jewish movement really pushes young Jewish kids to um, believe and buy into this ideology that the only ways that we can successfully exercise our Jewishness and our Jewish culture and identity is by essentially bowing down to the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I had to come to terms with and I'm continuing to come to terms with seeing as there aren't many spaces when I was growing up for um, Jews of color to talk mm. about their experience, mm. for example, um, going to Israel or going and kind of engaging in these environments. And so it left me feeling very lost, you know, um, because here I, you know, obviously deviate from my family's political beliefs and feel uncomfortable in the spaces that I've largely grown up in. You know, I'm culturally Jewish and I'm comfortable in that identity, but the ways in which you're treated in these spaces, especially if you don't support the state of Israel, regardless of whether or not you're a Jew of color, is very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that's often weaponized. I mean, I hear a lot of questions sometimes if random people come into our panels, they'll raise their hand and they'll say, well, aren't you being anti-Semitic or mm -hmm. isn't this this? And it's I often just kind of use, well, I'm Jewish, so actually I know what I'm talking about, um, just because that typically puts that to rest, but I shouldn't have to be saying that yeah. uh, in the beginning. 
in order for what I, you know, what I'm saying to be valid, it's not an issue of my identity. It's an issue of settler colonialism and oppression. And I mm. think that's clear. Mm. But to come back to your point with organizing around um, BDS, while I'm not sure if it's formally a part of the BDS um, framework, a lot of people that I grew up in in these kind of American Jewish spaces have been talking with me recently about taking um, and util utilizing their birthright trip. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I am very staunchly against <laughs> because being surrounded by people that have worked for birthright, that have led birthright tours, my mom went to birthright and grew up extensively in that kind of environment, um, I see how manipulative that form of a cultural connection is mm -hmm. and how that really is the key you know as you mentioned in taking students and young people that really have the potential and ability to understand the issue of settler colonialism and of indigenous struggle and oppression in Palestine and flip it on its head and essentially converting a generation of young people that right now we're like in this really interesting time in the world where you know we're talking about why the United States is bad and we're talking about you know socialism and why we deserve health care and why indigenous people deserve rights we're talking about decolonization and why it shouldn't be used as a metaphor we're talking about these important things and I see so many people being taken advantage of through that way because of a historical disconnection or a historical need to feel validated for being Jewish, you know? Mm -hmm. And I see that as anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. right? But the only ways in which American Jews are taught to feel comfortable and confident in being Jewish and in being proud of their Jewish identity is in order for them to go on some sort of birthright trip and to pledge allegiance to Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I just want to interject something yeah. here because I think Sarah's you know, just so impressive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I just want to point out that you did not talk about your fear around BDS. And I just want to underscore that mm. because uh -huh. there's such an attempt to make it this scary thing mm. to support BDS mm. and that your name will go up on Canary right. Mission and all these, Zion, you know, these Zionists mm -hmm. will be after you, which all of which can be true. Oh, yeah. And I just mm. I just think that Sarah is so inspiring because of Thank your you. fearlessness. <laughs> <laughs> so she has kind of come out and said yeah. things about the administration and faculty's right. racism. And mm. right yeah. now in talking yeah. about this, this kind of fearless support that I hope other people will take note Thank of you. because really there's not much that can happen to you <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. when these people they can yeah. say you know they, they, they can say yeah. horrible right. things to right. you on email right. and right. they can tweet horrible right. things yeah. to you but really this kind of fearlessness is is so impressive mm. to me yeah yeah i mean uh, yeah it's um, i mean without saying it you know <laughs> it's right there but um, you know i i was gonna say since you're jewish and they cannot say you're anti-semitic they would oh, they say can. you're a self-hating jew right you know? and and the thing is uh, you know i grew up my jewish side of the family is very very culturally jewish mm. very very immersed in you know the uprising that came out of the holocaust and mm. came out of really like mass migration to the united states and so my mom speaks fluent Hebrew. I went to Saturday school and Sunday school my entire life. You know, I really like had the classic, like typical, you know, upbringing when you think of what like the American Jewish movement mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. except for the fact that I'm brown and <laughs> I'm also Muslim. So that mm -hmm. complicates things mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, growing up where my parents disagree on this issue, I remember, you know, even though I spent a lot of time in Palestine, in occupied Palestine, you know, surrounded by Israelis, surrounded by Israeli culture and uh, propaganda and basic ideology, Zionist ideology, I remember that when I was 15 years old and I was like thinking to myself, like, this isn't right, you know, I started writing. I started writing poems about my experience and how people would yell slurs in Hebrew at me because they could tell, you know, that I looked different, that there was something off, that there was something different. And I remember expressing this to my Baba and he, he said, you know, I have just the thing for you. And I thought it was going to be like 
a beautiful speech about how I'm wanted, <laughs> loved, and accepted, or how, you know, something like that. He handed me Orientalism by uh -huh. Edward Said, and he said, read it, kid. And I was like, this is not what I want right now. This is not what I need. But it absolutely was, and it absolutely is. Uh -huh. Right? Uh -huh. And I think that that's something that <laughs> needs to be kind of recirculated with you know this generation of young people. We need to be challenged in the moments when we feel lost the most. Mm -hmm. We need to be challenged in a sense that there's a way that you can cope and there's a way that you can emerge, not just with a newfound sense of identity and you know a more comfortable kind of feeling in your body with who you are, but in your fight for justice, mm -hmm. you know? Because we've been taught that supporting Israel is supporting the Jewish people. That's how you know we support mm. ourselves. Mm. And that's not true. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's just not true. Mm -hmm. And I really I hope to see more of that dismantling. And I see that done through um, the UH organization for students and faculty for justice yeah. in Palestine. And on the note of you know engaging in conversations, I think that that's something that we can do even more of, you know? I feel like there's, like you said, there's a lot of fear on BDS, you know? And just even by talking about it, it, it changes the stigma, you know? Mm -hmm. And it really changes the way that students are thinking about it. Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, the one impressive uh, guy among a number of them is uh, Miko Pellet, who wrote the book, The General's Son. Mm -hmm. And he was like a Zionist par right. excellence, and he comes from a family that really his grandfather signed the declaration of quote-unquote independence right. for <laughs> the state of Israel and then he moved you know all the way mm -hmm. to seeing the difference between Zionism and Judaism mm -hmm. and so he's comfortable in his Judaism but of course it's not Zionism right yeah and uh, I mean to the point that he talks about a one-state uh, solution right. etc and uh, he married a Palestinian, you know. So, <laughs> so you see how people have those journeys, right. you know. Um, I just uh, wish it wouldn't take as long. Yeah, as yeah, me, yeah. Like, I know. Uh, Elan Pape is another one. Right. I'm just talking about mm -hmm. the, you know, um, historians right. and uh, you know, someone with the history of uh, Miko and all of that. Um, Ali, you also like, um, you know, teach uh, a course and. Um, especially, um, you know, about um, how technology is being used by uh, Israel and, uh, you know, in terms of for, to subjugate and oppress, repress uh, the Palestinians. For, could you say something about that? I, uh, uh, most of my work is on, uh, uh, on formations of violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, when I teach, I, I actually don't focus on uh, Palestine that much. Mm. Uh, I, I look into how mobile uh, technologies of violence mm. are. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly, you know, Israel features in many of the works out there that are critical, mm -hmm. that try to uh, understand uh, the violence that's taking place in the world today and the role of war. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important things, of course, when it comes to that is that settler colonial states, particularly states like the United States, like Israel, like uh, South Africa, were really important in shaping this world of war we exist mm -hmm. in today. Um, so it's hard to escape it. Um, but uh, aside from my teaching, of course, my, my project is, is all about uh, uh, violence in, in Gaza in particular and how Israel is kind of using uh, drone and robotic technology mm -hmm. to really try to uh, contain the Palestinian people and kind of continue with its regime as if uh, you can just delegate violence yeah. to uh, some machines and just forget about their existence yeah. as course those machines buzz and kill yeah and it's stuff. the machines that do it not us you mm -hmm. know that kind of stuff you know yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting what's happening right there but um, you know I just wanted to uh, like share with the um, you know um, people um, the viewers uh, you know what kind of uh, issues you are dealing with as well 
you know. Uh, but uh, going back, um, Cindy, to um, you have a website here or something. Um, could you um, tell us something about what we're gonna be seeing on the um, on the screen in a bit? There you oh, go. this is just a, a yeah. Facebook page. Yeah. Um, this is one of my very poorly made flyers, and yeah. it's just a place that we have news for the different things that mm -hmm. the group has mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. so, so this is Yusuf. This is right. Yusuf yeah. who came to Hawaii as part of a longer tour, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, we, we've featured people that have spoken here. So here is Nora after Nora. she's won her um, her book award. Yeah. And um, the, the event that they did at mm -hmm. Church of the Crossroads on mm -hmm. the Nakba, the mm -hmm. ongoing Nakba. Mm -hmm. um, more on Yusuf. So these are just the most recent mm -hmm. things that have happened. We also did, um, he, Yusuf also met with members of Congress See, this is yeah, taking a while to who load Who are up. these guys? Uh, this is about the bill that was before Congress mm. um, for the um, to protect the rights of children mm -hmm. that Betty McCollum had mm -hmm. um, had sponsored. And this is um, these are people that this is Josh Rubner who. Mm. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Something happened. Never mind. That's, we we can cut. <laughs> oh, here, here, we okay. got it. We okay. Got it back. Um, anyway, this is just uh, some coverage of. Mm -hmm of that event, mm -hmm. but um, this is a place that if you were to scroll down, and I don't think we should really necessarily take the time to do that now, mm -hmm. you would see here is Mon Auda's um, embroidery mm -hmm. talk, um, which was live streamed mm -hmm. if you're interested in catching mm -hmm. that. And so it's just been a, a kind of place where you can see the different things that the group has done. This is something that Mon had done from his refugee camp that he lives in, um, um, Beisha refugee camp, mm -hmm. where he had the kids do the Mauna, mm. um, <laughs> solidarity with the Mauna. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so that was really kind of cool to get right. um, to receive that. And th these are the kind of exchanges, I think, that mm -hmm. are facilitated mm -hmm. um, by the group. I, I just, rather than scroll through, I do want to highlight um, something else that wasn't during November, but was a really exciting thing, which was the students who organize, there are students at Beers 8 University mm -hmm. who in um, conjunction with the National Students for Justice in Palestine group, organize a right to education tour. Mm -hmm. And so we had um, Noor um, Douglas and Mai Hassan mm -hmm. come for a week and visit here as students from Beers 8 two University. Years ago or three? It was like three, three, three years maybe. ago. Yeah, yeah, and I Angela remember. Davis um, yeah. engaged in a round right. table with them. Right. And they met again with a lot of people here. And one of the things that was the most striking for me about one of the most striking moments about that was um, Candace Fujikani mm -hmm. helped us coordinate an environmental mm -hmm. justice tour mm -hmm. for them in Y&I with the mm -hmm. concerned elders of Y&I. They extended the tour and made it a longer kind mm -hmm. of special tour for them. And at the end of that tour, we were driving home and we stopped just at a beach mm -hmm. to get something to eat. There was mm -hmm. a kind of fair happening. And all these people started giving my and your things, mm. t-shirts and honey, <laughs> and and they and you know they were a little surprised that people yeah. were giving them things, and they said, "You're the Palestinians," uh -huh. and they said, "How do you know?" And they're like, "Oh, we knew you were coming today," uh -huh. and there was this kind of the news had traveled along the Waianae coast, and there was this welcoming to to Noor and to my. Um, as they, you know, as they visited the Waianae Coast. And, and so I think these kinds of smaller moments are actually meaningful ones. Um, the Rapoons have been really welcoming at their farm for different Palestinian visitors who have come. And, and uh, you know, they leave with chocolate and honey and um, yeah. all kinds of the beautiful food that the rapoons grow, but also with this sense of connection of these, these struggles taking place mm. that are about land and about the possibilities of working without state formation or permission mm. to, you know, um, create your own forms of governance and connection to land. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that, especially uh, with Angela Davis, mm, uh, mm -hmm. she was uh, really uh, good with the uh, two kids from Palestine. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, she actually made uh, them. The, yeah. the, there was a long line of people waiting yeah. to get into that event uh -huh. because I think, let's face it, Angela Davis yeah, right, draws a crowd. Right, right. And she was so generous, she really yeah. gave her time over to Noor and mm. to Mai. Yeah. No, it was uh, impressive. Um, the other thing in terms of uh, future activities, uh, mm -hmm. um, one uh, uh, or just before that, uh, like uh, you said, like uh, American Sociological Association uh, passed a resolution on uh, American, uh, yeah, Studies uh, 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 American Studies Association. American Studies, sorry, uh, sorry, American Studies Association. Um, what um, other uh, you know academic associations? Uh, I know of like Association for Asian American Studies did uh, actually these were the first guys uh, who did that. Boycott, I think. Yeah. Um, the yeah, the Association for Asian American Studies, uh, the Native American Native, and Indigenous yeah. Studies mm -hmm. Association. They didn't pass a resolution, but mm -hmm. they they made a statement yeah. quite early on. Be, that was before ASA. Yeah. The American um, Humanity or something, the Humanities Association. Uh, um, I can't remember what their acronym yeah. is, but they yeah. passed a resolution. Mm -hmm. The Critical Ethnic Studies Association yeah. has passed one. The African Lit Association, mm -hmm. I believe, has a resolution. Mm -hmm. The MLA fought a good fight. Yeah, but <laughs> and not, not only yeah. did we not emerge with yeah. a resolution, but we emerged with a, a anti-BDS uh, yeah, resolution. Yeah, well, so that was, yeah. um, on the one hand, a, a lost battle, yeah. and on the other hand, it's always about the education that takes yeah, place, but, and I but, think a lot of really yeah. powerful education happens. But also galvanized a lot of people. Yeah, uh, that's what MLA. I'm saying. I yeah. think it did galvanize yeah. a right, lot of people. Right. Um, so. <coughs> and I'm trying to think of what other organizations... Uh, what about the uh, American uh, Anthropological... That um, also was a very... Um, uh, that was close, a very close, yeah. um, co close call, and yeah. actually, they ran an exemplary campaign mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that even though they didn't win the vote, mm -hmm. I think they educated so much of their membership. Yeah. And one of the things that happens is that there's a lot of really dirty politics mm -hmm. on the part oh, yeah. of oh. Um, Zionist opponents who mm -hmm. travel to these, to become members of these different organizations. Uh -huh. In the case of the MLA, um, the the strategies were quite nefarious, actually. Mm -hmm. they, they kind of mocked the MLA um, heading yeah. and sent out mail that looked like it was directly from LA, MLA. They had money that they admitted to getting from Israel, mm -hmm. and they managed to data mine all the members mm -hmm. and send them pretty yeah. um, dishonest emails. Mm -hmm. So the tactics have not been admirable on the yeah. part of the Zionists. And then this was like Israeli intelligence work. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's uh, really clear. So it's like And it's surprising that they mm -hmm. admit it. Kerry mm -hmm. Nelson, who travels from one organization mm -hmm. to the next to defeat these resolutions, um, admitted in an Israeli paper to getting funding from Israel to do the kind of work mm -hmm. that he does. Yeah. So yeah. even they had to put a lot of pressure and a lot of effort mm -hmm. and energy mm -hmm. to defeat, uh, you know, that. Mm -hmm. But uh, with all of that, they haven't been able to do it with the American Studies Association, the AAAS, uh, NISA, the uh, <coughs> Indigenous uh, Studies Association, and Critical Studies, and uh, you know, a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of that. So that's interesting. So I just wanted to show that. This uh, boycott is happening. And in fact, uh, Israel is putting so much energy into it because even like uh, <coughs> this infamous uh, prime minister of uh, Israel, Netanyahu, you know, who's really <laughs> corrupt to the core, um, really said like this is, I mean, he said something like this is very dangerous in terms of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Israel and its uh, politics in terms of relationship with uh, you know, European um, states and others, you know. So, I mean, they take it seriously, and that's why they put a lot of energy into it. But I wanted to also ask about, um, we have five minutes uh, left, so we can talk about future activities. If yeah. you can flip to the computer screen, I do want to mm. yeah, we can say do that, that yeah. Malek Matar is um, going to be our next confirmed visitor. Mm -hmm. She is an artist from Gaza. She is not yet 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And 
Uh, she's a painter, mm -hmm. and she's now studying in Istanbul. Istanbul with mm. uh, Yusuf. Yusuf also Yusuf is, doing is his also PhD studying in there. Istanbul, yeah. And so we're excited to have her visit next year. And she's um, again really interested in connecting mm -hmm. between Palestine and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that will be in November, but it will be happening in tw the next academic year. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's uh, an interesting thing because um, <clears throat> we can also make connections because uh, the uh, um, Center for Islamic and Middle East Studies at Cal State University San Bernardino and Arab Studies Quarterly, uh, we're going to have in October, October 2nd and 3rd, the second um, conference, academic conference here. So you are all invited. <laughs> uh, to that, <laughs> to you know, s uh, you know, do something about Palestine or whatever you know, uh, uh, the technologies of war that you're talking about would be a wonderful thing to do. You know, a uh, paper on and so forth. We can have panels. We can have, uh, you know, round tables, uh, etc. We still have uh, like three minutes, but I just wanted to put uh, this, um, you know, um, on the table so that we can like plan accordingly, you know, for the next year, uh, etc. Uh, so other um, uh, future activities, um, you know, you st do you still have the, um, <coughs> like, um, uh, study group or something going on uh, with uh, the students? Uh, well, and unfortunately, since I'm trying to finish my dissertation, it's yeah. been really hard <laughs> <laughs> to uh, yeah. Dedicate time yeah, to, sure. to the reading group, but I yeah. I hope we'll be back to it yeah, soon. Yeah. Uh, uh, we just finished a decolonial November, uh, mm. yeah. so it's been uh, uh, there was a Catch lot to take summer. in. Yeah. Yeah. So we're kind of right. Oh, we're kind of uh, just uh, uh, you know getting back on our feet. Yeah, uh, sure. uh, but uh, we've learned a lot yeah. uh, from this year and. Uh, uh, turns out, yes, there's a lot more to do. Uh, so and we'll start with yeah. Medic. Well, uh, I just came up with this uh, crazy idea. Like one might uh, want to have like a short, uh, you know, narrative about it, like write up something and can be put somewhere. Um, I mean, I would be happy <laughs> to put it uh, in uh, Arab Studies Quarterly since I'm the editor of that, you know. <laughs> so we can put it in Arab Studies Quarterly as um, activities in terms of, you know, um, supporting Arab issues, uh, Arab-American issues, etc. We can do that. I mean, that would be no problem. Uh, so, yeah, we can talk more about the ins and outs of that, you know, and the um, mechanics and so forth. So, um, anything else? We still have like a, a couple, uh, one minute, okay, one minute. So, <clears throat> uh, tell us something about uh, how you see the <clears throat> very near future, like maybe next semester, you know, in terms of, acti <laughs> in terms of activities. I can barely see it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of activities, you know, you envision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Unahale Katsen just released a new album. He's one of the artists that has been collaborating, um, as Cindy mentioned, with organizations in Palestine. And I think that as he continues to hold his presence on the Mauna at Mauna Kea, he's hoping to kind of expand the kind of programming and some of the classes he taught at Puuhuluhulu University and engage really in the connections between Hawaii and Palestine and hopefully bring that back to the campus as well. Uh, last week during the La Kuoko'a celebrations, there was an event at Bale where he rapped um, and gave an ode to Palestine. So promoting those kinds of events and keeping that kind of really mm -hmm. great decolonial November energy throughout yeah. the year. Well, uh, we're flat out of time. Uh, thank you very much all yeah. for coming. It was wonderful. And you know, you're the new generation. <laughs> <laughs> We're counting on you. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're in good hands. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, all. And uh, thank you, viewers. Um, mahalo nui loa, and see you uh, next year. Aloha. Mm -hmm.